By now, we're all familiar with the story. DC Film reportedly screens very well in test screenings with audiences. Maybe the best pre-screenings ever. Wow. Then the reviews come in a week in advance of the premiere. And it's objectively bad. Seemingly, though, cultist fans love it. Diehard fans attend it, and it makes millions and millions of dollars worldwide. But <laughs> it's just no Marvel movie. Marvel good. DC bad. Black Adam opened this weekend to a similar story, and I was very excited because it felt like a fun new direction for DC when it was announced. I was excited for the Justice Society on screen, but the reviews came in, and I expected hot, wet garbage as a result. Uh, but what I watched was honestly pretty good. In fact, it's a much better and much funner movie than I expected, better even than a lot of recent Marvel movies, and that's not saying a lot, um, but it's not perfect. But it's not a 40% movie on Rotten Tomatoes. So let's talk about Black Adam and why it's getting the reviews that it is. I'm Dan Umpton, and this is the Doomcast. First of all, thanks a lot for watching, and if you don't mind, do me a favor, hit subscribe and the bell. I make about one of these videos a week. They're all great. You don't want to miss any of them, so don't. Um, I want to get out front here and point out my own biases. First, I'm a huge JSA fan. Uh, the Johnson Goyer era of Justice Society of America in the early 2000s basically rekindled my adult comic fandom, specifically the return of Hawkman arc and the characters of Black Adam, Naboo, or Dr. Fate, and Hawkman. I also have considered myself a bigger DC fan historically than Marvel, but not in film. I did not like the Snyderverse generally, um, but there were parts of it that I thought were pretty good also. Even though I went in wanting to like it initially, expecting garbage, um, what I got was what a good friend referred to as a Velveeta grilled cheese sandwich, which is to say a pretty good movie. Cheese sandwich is accurate, comforty, tasty, satisfying, and yeah, not terribly nutritious. Not highbrow, but still good for what it is, and it knows exactly what it is. It reminded me less of modern superhero film and more of 90s blockbuster action films. Less Zack Snyder, more Michael Bay, but yes, there's lens flare and entirely too much slow-mo in this movie. When they announced this movie, The Rock is not precisely who I imagined as Teth Adam, uh, but he absolutely sells it. He's enjoying what he's doing, and The Rock is a person who's definitely fun to watch when he's having fun, and he is in this movie. Pierce Brosnan and Aldous Hodge are both well-established without the bothersome exposition to try and explain all of their lore, which would have been a mistake, and I'm glad that they didn't. It's better saved from maybe a Hawkman solo movie or any other sequel you're going to do with the Justice Society. Cyclone and Atom Smasher are much thinner characters, uh, but still fun to watch. Just the same. The girl does win. The guy grows big. What's there to know? Well, <laughs> anything about them? I would have liked a lot more. I didn't dislike them, but they felt like they could have been completely written out of the movie. Also, Atom Smasher running around with a bucket of chicken half the time didn't make any sense to me. The characters of Sarah, Amon, Kareem, and Ishmael, they all had very clear desires and motivations. Amon and his mom, Sarah, uh, work to free Kendak from intergang, the criminals who have occupied their country and act as its warlords and government. Kendak is this Middle Eastern country that exists in comics, uh, where we're asked to believe that human civilization started not something that happened in comics. Uh, it's King Acton enslaved its own people uh, to mine enough Eternium metal to make a crown of Sabak, which is a demonic hat that would make him able to do even eviler shit than enslave his own people. I, that's a little part where things get a little thin. Uh, the wizards of the Rock of Eternity summoned their champion and turned him into Teth Adam, uh, a 50-year-old guy with a shredded body and lightning powers. And 5,000 years later, Sarah wakes him up while stealing the crown and a very fun action scene uh, set to a medley of paint it black ensues with a lot of slow-mo, maybe more than they needed, but it was still cool. And uh, every action scene feels fluid in this movie. Uh, the story progresses very logically. It's not a mess at all. The main villain is a little forgettable. There is a slightly pointless second act detour, yes, but it's not just coherently structured. It's clever. It's subversive. It's genuinely funny in a way that Love and Thunder absolutely wasn't. Uh, the humor feels natural and smooth. Uh, it's actually the most fun that I've had at a superhero movie in quite a while because it felt 
not like work. It didn't carry any baggage with it at all. It didn't have anything to prove. And the movie felt lighter, thematically and visually, much more than the Snyderverse films. It felt like the kind of hopeful, positive, fun DC that I enjoyed as a kid, and now it's on the big screen. The third act wasn't an everything is on fire final battle mess, but yeah, there's a showdown, and the way it ended was pretty clever. The entire movie, totally different from every other DC film for the most part. The Suicide Squad, Birds of Prey, Aquaman, anything Snyderverse, all completely different. It's not at all a Marvel film. I've seen people describe it as anti-woke, but <laughs> what does that mean? It cast a black woman for a red-headed comic character. Is that, isn't that what you guys call woke? It's, it's not America-centered. It's very Arab-centered. It's even almost subversively pro-Arab. Isn't that woke? Amon and Sarah even criticized the idea of Western heroes and global peacekeeping and global stability. Uh, it's actually woker than Captain Marvel or She-Hulk or, uh, you know, the casting uh, Lady Thor, which was a thing that had happened in comics already, but you don't pay attention to that. But the anti-wokes love it. They love this movie. Why? <laughs> Because woke is meaningless, because it's shorthand for whatever it is that I dislike. And you think that this is not that. It's not perfect. There are some corny parts. There's a rushed third act. There's a forgettable final villain. A pretty exciting post credit scenes. But by no means is this actually a bad movie. I give it a B-. minus. So why is this getting bad reviews? And because I think... It seems like a wealth of reviewers are simply comparing Doctor Fate to Doctor Strange and Hawkman to Thor and feel like this is unoriginal, despite not being aware that both of those characters predate Strange and Thor by like 25 years. Whatever. I mean, Smile, which opened last weekend, I think, is at 78% on Rotten Tomatoes, and it's just a less exciting, less suspenseful version of It Follows. So I don't know what reviewers generally think or not about originality. It feels like this movie got Dark Phoenixed, which was bad in and of itself. The fourth X-Men first class movie was not the unwatchable garbage that everybody wanted you to think it was. Um, and I still don't know why they did that with that. It still wasn't a perfect movie by any means either. But my thought is this. One, people, reviewers in general, but people are especially tired of superheroes. More than that, reviewers are also relying on early screenings to compete for clicks and views in an online journalism world. And while the superhero fatigue probably explains the poor reviews in that part, the disproportionately good Marvel reviews for movies that are increasingly much worse uh, are probably explained by the latter. Disney has a documented history of blackballing reviewers from early showings, uh, which counts them out of getting those clicks in that competition uh, if they aren't able to see those pre-screenings. They did that to the LA Times, and they've done it to other outlets, not always for critical reviews, but also criticism of their business practices. Marvel doesn't need to pay reviewers for better reviews of, for example, Love and Thunder, which is definitely a solid 64% on Rotten Tomatoes. They don't have to pay them. They know that they'll give them something that's a little bit more favorable because they don't want to be shut out. But any person that watches Love and Thunder, for example, and thinks that that film is objectively better than Black Adam, on its face, that raises the people's eyebrow. Thanks everybody for watching. This has been the Doomcast. We'll see you next week.